Um, today I just want to briefly talk through um, the implementation side of the world. And uh, what I'm basically going to do is talk a little bit about transportation services, how we fit into this uh, question, um, the, the demands we have for public right of way. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our experience in Philadelphia, not that it is necessarily something you need to do here, but just a little bit about the process more than anything, which I think is important in terms of developing uh, what I'll say an operationalizing complete streets. Um, at the end of the day, the uh, policy statements we make um, are great, but they're policy statements. Uh, to really make complete streets real, you need to kind of turn it into something you can operationalize. Um, I'll talk a little bit about where we are, and then basically some of the challenges and lessons learned for kind of moving forward. So uh, within transportation services, our mission is basically to provide safe, efficient, and effective municipal transportation systems uh, and infrastructure to serve the needs in, of our residents, businesses, and visitors in an environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable manner. A um, bit of a mouthful, but I think it does capture exactly what we do. I think the important thing to highlight here is that uh, historically, um, this has been the Department of Highways. Uh, I'd like to say and like to think that we're no longer uh, simply a Department of Highways. We're no longer Department of Traffic. Uh, what we have now um, with our groups, uh, such as our cycling infrastructure group and our public realm group, is a true 21st century transportation organization. Thank you. <laughs> that is not one of our employees. <laughs> so anyway, um, just the, the, our, our responsibilities um, include kind of programming, operating, maintaining, and managing the public road allowance. Uh, owning and designing construction projects for transportation projects, non-transit transportation projects, planning and designing and constructing bicycle facilities, traffic safety planning, right-of-way management, uh, streetscapes within the public allowance, and also street furniture. Uh, so our, our, our world is simply more than just paving roads uh, and basically keeping the lights on. Um, it, it's evolved into something larger, greater, and I think that this is pretty common um, through most major cities now that are basically Di uh, divesting themselves of simply the moniker of being a road builder and are basically looking to move people about cities. Our asset system is pretty large at this point and I, I want to point this out just to kind of give folks some context. Uh, we oversee roughly 5,600 kilometers of road, roughly 8,000 kilometers of sidewalk, about 400 kilometers of bike facilities, 600 bridges, 2,200 traffic signals, uh, pedestrian crossings, a million signs, that is an estimated number, not an actual number. Um, 4,100 bus shelters and another 9,000 pieces of street for furniture. So this is, um, it's a pretty complex organization. Um, I'll say I, I chose to come to Toronto because um, I think of the very professional uh, organization that exists. Um, I think we do a very good job here. To put things in the context in Philadelphia, um, which is about, I'll say 60% of the size of a uh, of Toronto, we had a, a staff that was about one third the size. We had an operating budget that was about 20% the size, and a capital budget that was about 15% of the size. So, um, what drew me here is that folks seem to take infrastructure seriously, and as part of that, um, taking the you know it's not just again the roads, but it's also about the pedestrian realm. I'm going to have to um, give kudos to uh, one of our uh, folks on our team, Mark Van Helsberg, kind of put this. Um, images together for me, but uh, this simply points out all the demands that we have within our right away. And um, I, I, I'm having a tough time reading them here from the angle, but um, but as you can see, uh, everything from transit vehicles to cafes to utilities to trees to transit shelters, um, these are all competing for uses within our right away. And in most cases, um, what our right away looks like is is anywhere from 15, 20 meters, in, in a lot of cases, upwards um, from there. So the point here is that when you look at all these demands and how they fit within our right away, um, you can see that to basically accommodate transit and two travel lanes and a sidewalk, we're looking at 20 meters, which is a pretty typical cross-section you have on King and Queen and a lot of areas. Um, you want another layer of parking in there. You want some um, space in there for cycling. You want some space in there for cafes. And you want space in there for other uses. Uh, you're now looking at 45 meters. Um, there's very few places within the city where we have 45 meters of right away. So our challenge is how do we fit all of these uses into the existing urban form? Um, this is not an option, uh, <laughs> even though we'd like to. Um, but I think much of what we do now is we have to look a little bit more, um, 
with an eye toward flexibility in terms of how we use space. And complete streets is basically, in many ways, requiring us to prioritize what are the uses that are going to get priority on various streets. Um, and ultimately what it comes down to is how do we allocate this space among the various areas that we have on it. So there's a lot of great products out there. Um, I think um, I'm highlighting a few here from San Francisco to New York to Chicago. Uh, there's been a lot of good work on this, but I think the one thing if you look at any of these products, um, they all have a kind of very unique bend, and you basically have to figure out what is it that Toronto needs. Um, some of them have more of an urban design focus, some of them have more of a transportation focus, some of them have more of a um, a streetscape focus. Uh, but the idea here is that um, I think there's an opportunity to basically tap into the best work of others at this point and figure out what does Toronto need at this point. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the approach we took in Philadelphia. And again, as I mentioned, uh, Philadelphia, we had kind of a unique situation, um, not historically viewed as a very progressive city on this front. And I think that many of the things that we are uh, that we were basically looking at was basically the same sort of issues you have here. We have a very built out urban form. We have very limited right away in most locations. And the question is, how can we better manage uses to make better streets for our citizens? And um, the first thing we did, and this is kind of, uh, we joke, jokingly call this uh, rainbows and puppy dogs, is we issued an executive order. And you know, basically it says all the right things that you'll see in any sort of complete street statement. But at the end of the day, um, this really is uh, platitude. Um, and basically the question is, how do we turn this into something that actually affects our built environment? So the approach we took, um, and this is kind of the content, um, it, was, it was not necessarily what Toronto needs, it's what Philadelphia needed. So um, we did have products out there on urban streetscapes, but that was about the limit of what we had. Um, we've gone through and basically done, in kind of parallel to this, a bike and pedestrian plan. Um, which kind of set in many ways the, the foundation and groundwork for our complete streets. And uh, the key elements in it are uh, basically the, the uh, introduction, which basically went through a lot of our sort of policies, the uh, elements of the street planning and design process, Oops. the uh, street type typologies we basically had developed in our city, um, a street typology that involved about 11 streets, 11 street types, um, that was what we felt we needed to do to adequately define the various uses that we wanted to prioritize within the roadway. Um, and then also basically we got into each of the individual elements and basically um, I'll say the biggest compliment we got through our process was simply from the development community who uh, had struggled for years. Um, we didn't like the right things down in Philadelphia so they would often do designs and have to come in and go through multiple iterations about what do you like, what do you don't like, and ultimately what we did is package the resource guide here to document all of our policies and basically all of our key contacts and all of our um, codes that basically influence the various elements of the design. And that, I think, the developers were ecstatic about. Instead of three, four, five iterations, in many cases it was one or two iterations that they had to come in for design review. Um, this was our general typology that we used, and it, again, doesn't work everywhere. The, the intent is not um, necessarily that we're going to have to have this on every street. In Philadelphia, we had many streets that were basically, um, I have to convert everything in my head, about 16 meters wide. So basically, it was about a 26 feet foot cross section and two um, seven or eight foot sidewalks in many of, the, many of our downtown streets. But the intent here is that we broke, broke out the public right away in a way that we could talk about various elements. City planning had gone through and basically developed the map and basically identified, like I said, our 11 street typologies. And um, this went from everything from a a walkable shared street to a local street to a commercial corridor. And so this basically became our underpinning for kind of coming up with our, our um, format for this. Um, a lot to look at here, but actually it says a lot. And so it's a one-stop reference for basically how we um, identified uh, the various elements. And over here you have everything from street furniture, bus shelters, uh, tree planters. And over here we had our 11 uh, street types. And a lot of this comes out to in complete streets is developing some sort of hierarchy. And while this isn't necessarily a perfect hierarchy, what we did do is we did define things. Oops, we did. This is good. Um, we did define things as being required, preferred, uh, desirable, and basically as space permitted. And so some of that basically at least outlined that on certain streets of certain widths, um, these are the things that were absolutely necessary, absolutely necessary, and these are things that I'll say were nice. Um, the big point here, though, is that. What we did do is basically we had minimum sidewalk widths for each street type, and we had minimum pedestrian pathways for each street type. 
Um, I think that is very important. Um, the idea of basically if you have a 25 foot sidewalk and you're only allocating five feet for the pedestrian pathway, um, probably not the best use in terms of uh, a transportation, um, uh, a very walkable street. Now, I love cafes, I love trees, um, but when you have something like that, um, you know, one key function of this is making sure people can actually walk down the street. And then basically for each of the street elements, we went through again, um, these are a general um, overview of the topic area. We did policies, we did um, the key um, city codes and organizations that needed to be contacted, and these were the ongoing uh, and updated contacts for each element. Um, again, my point here is that uh, what was needed in Philadelphia is very much different than, may, that, that, than what you may need here in Toronto. Toronto actually has a uh, good bit of um, groundwork already laid for this. There's a whole host of products that have been developed over the past 10 years that uh, I'm going through, I think, in many ways. They're very um, excellent foundations for kind of laying the framework. But ultimately what it has to come down to is how are we going to allocate the right away? And so that'll be the kind of, I think, the big conversation we need to have with Complete Streets moving forward. Um, again, uh, in developing Complete Streets, this isn't sort of a transportation thing, it's not a planning thing. Uh, we need buy-in from all of our partners. And this basically involves all of the partners that we have within the city, uh, everyone from municipal license standards to the police to the fire department, um, and then also um, a whole host of key external partners. And um, we do want everyone's input on this. It, it's not going to be fun. There's going to be some disagreements. Uh, but ultimately, I think we have to work through a lot of these things to figure out how is it that we want to allocate that space in the public railway. I guess some of the key challenges moving forward, I wish I could actually read some of them, um, uh, but I can actually help a little here. Uh, some of the key challenges that, that we experienced, basically I think um, agreement on what is needed for Toronto. And again, this is going to be the key point that we want to make uh, in terms of uh, city council has asked city planning and transportation to put together an approach in terms of how we develop complete streets for the city of Toronto. Um, and I think the first question we ask is, what is it we're looking to achieve? Um, what is it that we want out of our product? It doesn't need to look like Chicago's product. We need to figure out what, what makes the most sense for Toronto right now. Um, I think we need to look at accommodating kind of the diversity of urban form. Um, I think we need to look at the development patterns within the city are very different in terms of the suburban areas versus the, the middle areas versus the downtown area. And I think we need to develop something that is kind of uh, sympathetic toward um, the various sort of uh, urban forms that are out there. We need something that's detailed enough to provide clear guidance, but um, I'm nervous about doing absolutes. Urban forms are very complex, and I think that what we need to do is basically have something that is, um, I'll say, firm but flexible. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think we want to kind of not paint ourselves in the boxes. Um, we've gone through a lot of uh, this in our process, and for every time you think you have it nailed down, you can find four or five examples off the top of your head that don't necessarily meet standards. So um, the way we went was guidelines, um, and basically, to implement it, if you wanted to deviate from the guidelines, you basically had to explain why you wanted to deviate from the guidelines. Um, we wanted to align with many existing policies. I'll say the one thing I noticed in terms of going through a lot of the products that we had, we had a lot of existing policies that if you read them, you probably could read them that they would or could conflict with points. So we want to sort through some of those things. And then basically we also want to stand, understand the cost implications. And this isn't um, necessarily just about the capital cost, but ongoing operating and maintenance cost as well. These are going to be some of the key issues that you need to think through when you're kind of trying to outline um, what it is you want to look like, what it is you want your streets to look like. Kind of our lessons learned from Philadelphia, I think um, what we want to do is we want to have something that um, that can be operationalized. Um, and again, this is about kind of at the end of the day making sure as you design and rebuild that there's clear standards for which from which you can basically design something different and something better. Um, we again want to recognize that we have very diverse urban forms here, so we want to make sure we don't try to get one size fits all solutions. Um, we need all of our partners at the table. The last thing you want at the end of this is to have partners come out and say, I was not consulted on this. So I think we did a very good job of that in Philadelphia. And again, the, the equivalent of build in Philadelphia came to us and they, they kind of thanked us for the work we had done because at a minimum for Philadelphia what we did is we provided clear guidance as to what we thought was important. Um, again, we need to give it some key but we need to permit exceptions. You want some flexibility. They're, again, they're too complex. And then basically, um, as part of Complete Streets, you don't need to solve every issue. Um, and I think sometimes you get caught up in that. Um, Philadelphia, we call it version 1.0. We know it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be a living document. And uh, at the end of the day, 
um, what we want, we expect it to be a living document. And uh, so the process that we had, we basically, on the implementation side, for any new projects that came in, they had to go through a checklist. And as part of the checklist, um, did you adhere to all of our policies? And uh, we made it fairly simple. It's not something that's very laborious for designers. But at the end of the day, um, when they submit their plans in for city review, we have a, a complete understanding as to what they adhered to, what they didn't, and if they didn't, why they didn't. So it just, again, made the process a little bit more easy. Um, I want to give a little kudos to uh, our friends here and uh, colleagues. Um, Gabe Klein, who's here today, and, and Tim from San Francisco. Um, we've all been involved in an organization called NACTO. And um, the one thing that they're going to be doing, and I think the, the Urban Street Design Guide is coming out in October? Yeah. October. Um, Great product. I'm an engineer by training, and uh, you know, sadly, what what ends up happening is engineers always fall back on, well, it's not in the design man, so I can't do it. Um, and ultimately, NACTO is kind of pushing boundaries here, uh, and and uh, so they have created some pro products here. The first one is the Urban Bikeway Design Guide, which is already out. The second is going to be the Urban Street Design Guide, and um, I'll say this will give folks, uh, at least the designers. Um, some backing that there are incredible standards out there for them to deviate from what at times are probably a little sort of um, over the top suburban oriented design standards that we're trying to impose in many ways in, in downtown areas. So um, when these products come out, I'll uh, encourage everyone to take a look at them uh, and basically uh, see if we can kind of change some things here to basically uh, see if we can get better urban design standards within the city. So uh, at this point, I'm going to open the floor up, I guess, to, to the host here who's going to take it for some questions, but thank you for your time, thank you for having me, and we look forward to working with you.